Okay, uh, we'll get started. Uh, welcome to my class, EC 5500, uh, Nonlinear and Dynamic Programming for EC. Uh, last time when I taught this class, it was called uh, Optimization for Static and Dynamic Systems. That was back in 2021. And uh, since then, the syllabus has changed quite a bit. Uh, the videos for the previous lectures are already posted on YouTube, and I'll be posting the lectures for this particular class as well on YouTube every day. And there's a camera in the back that uh, is recording the lecture. Uh, I'll try to see if I can use the in-classroom camera now to record these lectures. I've never done it before, so I have to figure things out, how this works, and whether it'll be able to record my voice as well or not. So, um, but, but I'll, I'll keep you posted on uh, how, like whether I'll be using that for recording or whether I'll be using the classroom system for recording. Has everyone received this? Who has not received the course information sheet? Okay. Perfect. So what are the prerequisites for this class? Uh, this uh, 30, 3050, uh, which is signals and systems, or 5551, which is linear systems course, or if you're a graduate student in engineering or math or physical sciences, then you can enroll in this class uh, without any problem. Uh, this course is also open for undergraduates. How many undergraduates are there in this class right now? Three undergrads, okay. Uh, rest of them are graduate students, perfect. Uh, so uh, the way it works generally in a class where there are there is a mix of undergrads as well as graduate students, the assignments, the quizzes, the exams, they are all gonna be the same. But the grading curve will be different for undergraduates and the graduate students. Um, so the cutoff for A, A minus, B, B minus, all of that will be different for graduate students and undergraduate students. Um, <clears throat> the course text is uh, this book, Nonlinear Programming by Bertsikas. This is the second edition. The third edition has also come out a few years ago. Uh, you can use any of these two. Uh, any of these two versions, uh, there isn't much difference uh, except for a few topics are covered very well in the third version, which are not very well covered in the second version. Um, you know, the, the goal of this particular course, uh, well, okay, office hours. Uh, office hours is 11 to 12.30 p.m. in DL 464. Uh, that's my office. Uh, you can also send me an email if that particular time slot doesn't work for you in any week. Just send me an email and we'll figure out an alternate time to set up an appointment. Uh, the course text, I've already told you about it. Uh, the evaluation policy, there'll be six homeworks. Homeworks will be posted on Carmen, and uh, you can either submit a paper copy in class or you can submit a PDF copy on Carmen itself. Uh, I, I leave it up to you, there's no, uh, I mean, I, I don't, I prefer writing and I prefer paper copy, but if you want to do it online uh, on a PDF, that's completely fine. Uh, there'll be three online timed quizzes. Uh, the quizzes will again be posted on Carmen. Um, and you will have one hour to finish the quiz. Uh, and you can do it anytime you want to. So it's not going to happen during the class time. You can do it outside of the classroom. Um, there'll be 30% of the grade. There'll be two in-class midterms. And the reason why, uh, and, and one of the things I'm going to do in the midterm is uh, the Subject matter for the first midterm is going to be different from the matter that will be covered in the second midterm. So we'll use the first few classes, maybe 15 or so classes will be part of midterm one, and the next 15 or so classes will be part of midterm two. Uh, so that way you don't have to cram in a lot of stuff for the same exam. And there is one project. The project is 20% of the grade. And typically the way I advise students, uh, I'm sure all of you are looking for positions, you are looking for PhD, uh, uh, PhD positions or even like positions in companies. So you can pick up the project topic so that you can showcase your skill set to your future employer or a future research group. Uh, I have given, if you go further, on the second page and third page and the fourth page, I've given you several topics for the project that you can pick uh, in the area of mathematics, computer science, electrical engineering, aerospace engineering, operations research, and civil engineering. In the past, people have uh, 
spent considerable time on uh, the project. Typically, I expect you to work for 25 to 30 hours in the project. Um, you will have to write a five-page to six-page report on the project. And you know, depending on what your interests are, you can actually do an implementation. You can write a code uh, optimizing certain system. Or you can uh, just do a survey of multiple papers or um, books or topics uh, as part of your course project. <clears throat> um, grading will be, the grades will be curved at the end of the course. Uh, homework policy, you will have to write your own homework. Uh, you cannot copy and paste other person's homework. Uh, you have to write your own code. You have to understand your own code. Uh, you can, of course, take help from your students. You can take help from me. Uh, you can come to my office hours. And, uh, but you still have to write everything on your own. You have to write your own code. You cannot copy somebody else's code. Um, you cannot submit late homework. So if you want to submit homework, submit it before time. You will have two weeks for every assignment. So you will have enough time to uh, submit the assignment. And so don't, don't submit it late. Submit it beforehand. So that way, you can, uh, that way it's much easier for me to grade all the assignments together rather than assigning, uh, grading it at different points of time. Midterm 1 is on October 7th, and midterm 2 will be on November 13th. Uh, final project report will be due on December 4th. December 4th is the last day of the class. So that, that's when the project report will be due. And, uh, and of course, uh, the, most of the material uh, that we'll be teaching in the class will come from here. For static optimization, for dynamic optimization, I'll get the book in the classroom some other day. It's dynamic programming and optimal control. So I'll use that book to teach stuff in the classroom. Uh, once again, these are very expensive books. So if you want to buy it, you can buy it, but it's not, strictly speaking, not needed uh, for the purpose of uh, this class. You don't really need the textbook, but you can, if, if you want to study from the textbook, that's certainly possible. Any questions so far? Yes, please. Are the projects independent? Or? Independent, yeah. Any other question? Uh, what is the like, cutoff for A for graduate students? Uh, it will all be decided at the end of the class, depending on like top 10%. What's the cutoff for the top 10% or 15% of the students? Generally, it's 90 plus. Yeah. Any other question? For some reason, I feel that this time fewer people are taking this optimization class. I've had 55 plus people in optimization class before, because of which we got this big room, but the room seems half empty. <laughs> Uh, but anyways, I, I don't know what, what, why, why people are not taking this class. I mean, it is a foundational course for a lot of other ECE courses as well. Uh, there is ECE 6500 and 6501, which builds on top of this particular class. So <coughs> if you have friends who are interested in optimization, you should definitely invite them to come to this class. Wonderful. Uh, yes, please. I think those are related to stochastic optimization and uh, machine learning related optimization techniques. Um, but 5500 is a prerequisite for those two classes. So if you're, if you're planning on doing anything related to AI machine learning, reinforcement learning in the future, this serves as a foundational course for doing everything ML and AI later on. I'm also teaching another class, EC5555 this semester. Uh, that's on securing autonomous systems. It's on cybersecurity for autonomous systems. So if any of you are interested, feel free to join that class as well. Um, there will be some overlap between 5500 and 5555, but not too much. Maybe like five or six classes of overlap, and after that, the two courses are going to be independent. Okay. Um, so let's get started. Uh, so you know optimization is a 
is a very foundational course uh, now. I mean, it's a foundational topic now. Almost all industries want to optimize certain things. Um, they could optimize systems. They could optimize processes. They could optimize decision making. And so let me give you, let me give you concrete examples. Uh, so McDonald's wants to optimize their supply chain. McDonald's wants to optimize their energy consumption. McDonald's wants to optimize uh, the cost, the total cost of production of their food and services. And you know, sometimes uh, you might think that, oh, uh, maybe we can apply some simple rules, thumb rules, techniques, and we can optimize things. And that's definitely true. You can do that. Um, for instance, you know, in the early age of McDonald's, uh, their key innovation was how to set up the kitchen so that you can serve food faster, right? That was their uh, most important contribution in the early days. Now, setting up a kitchen is not an optimization process as such. I mean, certainly it requires a little bit of uh, uh, innovation, uh, but it's not something where you need to apply a lot of math and figure out, okay, this is how to set up the kitchen. But now, if McDonald's wants to optimize their entire energy consumption across all the McDonald's stores across the US, then certainly that becomes a very sophisticated mathematical problem. Uh, the reason why it's a mathematical problem is each building has its own energy profile. Uh, the weather impacts the energy consumption of the buildings of the McDonald, uh, McDonald uh, restaurants. And so they need to model the building. Uh, they need to figure out how the energy will be consumed on a day-to-day -day basis depending on the weather pattern. They need to collect all that data, put it in a server, and they need to try and optimize. I mean, they need to solve an optimization problem in order to figure out how to optimize the total energy consumption. So that is McDonald's problem. Uh, let's look at uh, machine learning and AI as a field. So whenever you are trying to train a model in machine learning or AI, you're trying to optimize a certain metric. Typically, it is the loss. Uh, so you want, you have a neural network or you have some, uh, some function approximating class, and you want to optimize the weights within that function, appro uh, within that function approximating class. And you set up a loss function, and then again, you need to apply some sort of optimization technique to figure out the optimal weights at which the loss is going to be minimized. Now, in all these cases, uh, what is the key is once you model the problem, once you figure out, OK, this is the mathematical problem, then you need algorithms to solve that particular problem. And this course is not about setting up of the problem. I think setting up of the problem is very, very field specific. And that's part of your course project. That's what I want you to study in your course project as to how to set up. You have a business problem. How do you set it up as an optimization problem? What's the variable? What's the function? What's the loss function? What is it that we are trying to minimize? What are the constraints on the minimization problem? So those are the things that will be expected in the course, in the course project. What we are actually going to do in the class is once we have set up the optimization problem, how do we start from an initial point in the space and go through a series of steps in order to get to a point which is the optimized solution for that particular problem? So in the case of energy management, what is the optimal set point I need to have? So in this particular room, I think the set point, there is a thermostat somewhere. I think it's in the back of the room. And that thermostat must be set at 74 degrees Fahrenheit, or 73 degrees, or 72 degrees Fahrenheit. And the question is, there are so many classrooms in the entire building. And there is, of course, the weather uh, outside. Uh, so you, you get the weather data, and you need to figure out what is the optimal set point in each of these rooms, so that the overall building energy consumption is minimized. Uh, so. So, so that's the optimal solution. And we are always looking for the optimal solution. And the question is, once we know what the problem is, how do we figure out what the optimal solution is? Inherently, optimization is a fairly mathematical field. Uh, some of the early uh, people who worked in optimization were actually mathematicians or applied mathematicians. And of course, now a lot of people are using optimization even within engineering field. But you know, because the underlying uh, tools for designing algorithms comes from mathematics. We actually first have to spend some time building that basics of calculus. I'm sure many of you might have already studied it before, 
but I still want to make sure that I go through the prerequisite material, which is uh, vectors, matrices, positive definite matrices, sequences, and series. So those are the things that I need to talk about uh, before we uh, get into the nitty gritties of algorithms. So in the next two, three classes, I'm going to spend some time talking about, so today I'll talk about vectors. And then I'll talk about matrices, convex sets, convex functions, continuous function sequences, and so on. So we'll, we'll just spend some time understanding some of these foundational topics in three classes, and then after that we'll move on to optimization methods. Okay, so vectors. So x is a vector in Rn, I'm going to write x as summation of xi ei i equals 1 to n where ei is the unit vector in the ith dimension this is the ith position So this is known as a unit vector in the ith dimension, right? So this one would be E4 because this is at, one is at the fourth position. What's the cool property of EI? The unit vector in the ith position. What are the cool properties of this particular vector? The norm of it is one. Norm is one, okay. Yes, please. It's orthogonal to all other unit Perfect. It is. It is orthogonal to all the unit vectors. Anything else that comes to the mind? No? I think those are the two most important properties. And uh, the so, so now we can generalize this particular idea and instead of saying that we have uh, EI which is the unit vector in the ith dimension, we can now pick any orthonormal, I, I think I first need to, let's talk about orthonormal basis. We haven't talked about norm yet but we'll talk about it uh, shortly. So we have V1, Vn, these are all vectors in Rn, forms an orthonormal basis if and only if norm of Vi equals to 1 and Vi transpose Vj equals to 0 for i not equals to j. Okay, so given, uh, we'll, we'll figure out how to create orthonormal basis. Uh, it's part of your assignment question, uh, but uh, but this is the definition of orthonormal basis. So a set of uh, vectors is, is called an orthonormal basis if each of them is of uh, a unit norm and they are all orthogonal to each other. Okay. Let's talk about norm. Oh, uh, well, before I talk about norm, let me talk about uh, decomposition of x along the orthonormal basis. So I have x, just like I've written it as xi ei, so xi is the ith component of x. 
uh, I can write x as some scalar multiplied by vi, i equals 1 to n. And remember, each of these are n-dimensional object. You multiply it by scalar, you get an n-dimensional object. You add it up, you get an n-dimensional object. So these are all n-dimensional vectors. How do I compute what value of alpha i is? How do we compute alpha i? Solve a bunch of linear, I think that's right, but uh, not quite. So, well, that is true, but because we know that these are orthonormal bases, there is an easier way to do it. Yes, the dot product of x and vi. Um, so this will give us, because vi's are all orthonormal, uh, we know that vi transpose vj will be equal to zero, so all we'll be left with is alpha i. Okay? So if you have an orthonormal basis and you want to find out what is the component of x along a specific orthonormal basis, you can just take the inner product between x and uh, that basis and you get the component. Okay? So I know that we have all been using different terms. So somebody said dot product. I'm talking about inner product. Uh, somebody in previous classes had mentioned about cross product. For all practical purposes, we are going to use the terminology inner product throughout this class. Inner product is the correct. Uh, so dot product and cross product is used more in physics. Inner product is what's used in mathematics. So we'll just use inner product. Um, <clears throat> okay, so there is one thing that we have not talked about yet, which is the norm. So let's talk about norms. What is a norm? Has anyone studied the formal definition of norm before in a, any of the math classes like calculus or analysis classes? Sorry? Uh, right, so that is one kind of norm, inner product with itself. It's called a Euclidean norm. But, uh, uh, but has anyone studied the more broader definition of norm? No? Okay. So norm is a map from Rn to zero infinity. So zero is included, infinity is not included. Are every, is everyone familiar with this notation? Okay. So norm is a map such that one, norm of x is greater than or equal to zero and norm of x equals to zero if and only if x equals to zero. So this is known as positive definite, positive definiteness of a norm. If I take the norm of uh, x multiplied by a scalar alpha, then it is equal to the absolute value of that scalar multiplied by norm of x. Okay, and there is a reason why we are talking about uh, norm in its most general sense. We'll get to it very soon. And the third one is the triangle inequality. What is triangle inequality? Can someone recall? Norm of x and class norm of y. Perfect. This is triangle inequality.
Okay. So the norm that uh, one of your friend talked about is called the Euclidean norm. And this is the norm that you must have studied in many, many courses. I'm going to denote it by L2, and this is square root of x transpose x. But there are other norms as well. So the L1 norm, This is L1 norm. LP norm. And then there is L infinity norm. So this is the norm all of you are more familiar with. L1, LP, and L infinity norm is something that people generally don't think about, but they are also important norms from the point of view of optimization. Okay, any questions so far? Yes, please. Uh, where do we use a single line around the vector and when do we use double line? Uh, so, uh, we don't use single line around the vector. These are all scalars. This is not a vector. This is also a scalar. This is also a scalar. But when we are talking, so when, when, when you have a scalar and you take this uh, single line, it means just absolute value. Whereas, if you have a vector, there is nothing known as absolute value of a vector. So you only take norms of a vector, and then that's denoted by with this double sign. Let's understand pictorially what this L1, L2, and L infinity norm looks like. So this is my R2, and I want to draw the unit ball. So what is a unit ball? So unit ball, let's denote it by B, where you take the LP norm of X, that should be less than equal to one, so that's a unit ball. So what is a, L, what is a unit ball with L1, uh, L1 norm? That would look something like this. This is my ball, let me call it BP. So this is my B1. So everything inside it, everything inside this, uh, this thing is part of the unit ball, where x of uh, L1 norm of x is less than or equal to one. What about the Euclidean norm? What's the, what's the ball in the Euclidean space? Yeah, circle. just a circle. That's my B2. What about L infinity norm? 
So L infinity norm is going to look like a square. This is the unit ball. This is my B infinity. Okay? So B1 is a very small, like it's a small surface area. B2 has somewhat larger surface area. BP for P, by the way, this P should be 1 to infinity. So BP is going to be larger than B2. For, for P greater than 2, BP is going to be larger than B2. And then B infinity is the largest ball. Because we are taking max of all the components of the vector x. And that has to be less than or equal to 1. OK, so this point would be, for instance, um, minus, yeah, minus 1, 1. This is 1, 1. So 1, 1 doesn't belong to B2, right? Because if you, what's the norm of, what's the Euclidean norm of 1, 1? It's square root of 2, right? So square root of 2 is not less than equal to 1. So it's not part of B2. It's strictly outside B2. <clears throat> Why do we need to know about norms? Why does norm help us in optimization or help us in life in general? Yes. It's kind of related, but does it kind of represent the like abstract the, the size of the vector? It does abstract the size of the vector, but where when do we really need the, to know what the size of the vector is? the distance from the right right so it it so every norm induces a metric a metric is a distance between two points right so how do we measure the distance between two points so let's talk about metric so that's where we use uh, norms quite a bit is to measure distance between two points While I won't go into the formal definition of a metric, uh, which looks very similar to norm, but basically a metric, let me call it D of x, y, is generally some norm of x minus y. Okay, and it tells us the distance between the two points. So every norm, induces a metric, and the metric is computed in this particular way. By the way, I know that I've not, I've only talked about these many examples of norm, but there are many, many different norms that you can define on Rn. Uh, and so each of those norms will induce a metric. Each of those metric will allow us to deduce whether I'm close to a specific point or I'm far away from the specific point. And why do we care about being close or far away from a specific point, what is that specific point? In the case of optimization, typically that's the optimal solution, right? So we want to measure how far we are from the optimal solution or how close we are to the optimal solution. So we use metric to figure that out. And depending on the problem setting, depending on the, uh, the way you have, uh, you have set up the problem, some norm may be more beneficial than the others. So while it's quite common in undergrad to just study Euclidean norm and do everything in terms of Euclidean norm. In optimization, you might have to pick some other norm which is much easier to work with in order to know whether you are close to a point of interest or you are far away from the point of interest. So every norm induces a metric. I'll give you another example of a non-trivial norm. It's called weighted. L infinity norm. So each of these wi is positive number. 
So that's a weighted L infinity norm. So depending on uh, you know what the situation is, you might want to measure yourself in the Euclidean norm. You might want to measure yourself with L infinity norm. The distance can be induced from L infinity norm or weighted L infinity norm and so on. And we'll go through many examples of this, different types of norms and how does it influence the optimization over the next 30, 5, 40 lectures. Any questions so far? So, uh, I usually see people who say, well, uh, norm as loss or L2 norm as loss. So, is, so what's the frequency of using like L1, L2 comparing to like L infinite norm? Uh, it it's all depends on which field you are coming from. So when I do dynamic programming, I'm almost always using L infinity norm. Um, but but if you are doing uh, signal processing, you would generally use X L2 norm. If you are doing um, compressed sensing or cleaning of signals, you are generally looking at L1 norm. So it really depends on what. Uh, what sort of area you are actually working in. Uh, I know that in medical imaging, I have seen a lot of people using more complicated norms uh, for, uh, for cleaning up the medical image. So I'll give you an example. Say uh, uh, you have a patient, the patient entered the MRI machine, and you are uh, taking the video of the heart moving, the heartbeat and all that. Now what happens is the patient might twitch a little bit, it might move around. Um, so that's going to add error to the video that you are capturing. Um, now you want to remove that error, right? So then you basically set it up as an optimization problem. Uh, the reason why I'm uh, talking about this example is because I'm in a candidacy exam of a student who is actually working on this problem. So that's how I know about this problem. So he's spending a lot of time and effort into figuring out what is the norm that he needs to use in order to clean up that image. Not, I shouldn't say image, it's actually a video of the heartbeat taken in an MRI machine uh, while the patient was moving or making some, I don't know, just moving around in the MRI machine. So how exactly do you filter all that noise due to the movement? So anyways, not something, something that is uh, trivial for now, but it becomes non-trivial when you start going into specific applications. So what norm to pick is a, something that you can sort of base your entire PhD on. It's that important. Okay, so let's look at the metric. So I have a bunch of points. So let's say this is my x. This is my y. If you look at the Euclidean distance between these two points, so each norm induces a metric, a distance. And the Euclidean distance between x and y is the length of this straight line. This is your Euclidean distance. What about L1 metric? What is the L1 metric between X and Y? So if you want to visualize the L1 metric, L1 metric is the total length of this line. So this, this line plus this line, you add it up, the total length, that gives you the L1 metric. And what about the L infinity metric between these two points? The L infinity metric is maximum of this or this. Okay, that will give you the L infinity norm. And one thing you will notice, I know it's, it's, a, it's a bit difficult to visualize, but you will notice is uh, X is equal to Y if and only if either this distance is zero or this distance plus this distance is zero, or the maximum of this distance and maximum of 
this distance and this distance is zero. So under all these three conditions, x will be equal to y. And that's because of this condition, that the norm is zero only if the va value of that vector is zero. So x equals to y means that x minus y is zero. And you can see that no matter which metric you pick, if you want to know if x is equal to y, you can pick any of the three metrics and you will know whether, as long as the metric is zero, the value of the metric is zero between the two points, uh, you know that the two points are the same. Any question? Um, I think I missed the point where you talked about the L, if, uh, if, if L infinity. So L infinity norm is the maximum of this length and this length. So let's say this length is, no, I can't use L. Z. Z1 and this is Z2. So the Any other question? Okay. Let's talk about sequences now. So we talked about vector, we talked about norms, uh, we talked about metric, let's talk about sequences. Has anybody studied sequence before? No? <laughs> yeah, that was long time ago. <laughs> okay. Uh, sequence. So we have a sequence. A sequence is basically a bunch of vectors. X1, X2. That's a sequence. So I'm, I start with a point x1, and then I'm going to some other point x2, and then another point x3, and so on. That's a sequence. So sequence is basically a set of points. We'll generally denote it by xk. k goes from 1 to infinity. So k goes from 1 to infinity and it's a subset of Rn. And basically if you visualize it, this is x1, this is x2, this is x3. You can think of it as a set of points that are scattered in the space. But there have to be infinite number of points. It's not a finite number of points. So xk, k goes from 1 to infinity. It's a subset of Rn. It's a subset of Rn because it's all scattered in the space of Rn. Are you saying the length of the vectors is infinity or the, or the length of the C? No, the number of points is infinity. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so you can have sequences that do not converge and you can have sequences that converge. So let me give you an example. Let's consider uh, points on a spiral, okay? Okay, so this is my, I'll just draw the spiral so that it's easier to visualize. So this is my x1, this is my x2, this is my x3, x4, x5, and so on. So I, I draw a spiral and I pick points along the spiral. I pick infinite number of points along the spiral. Now, what I get is a convergent sequence. It is a convergent sequence because there is a point 
because uh, if you look at these points, it basically collapses to a single point eventually. At infinity, it collapses to a single point. That's called a convergent sequence. If you just scatter the points like this, uh, it's generally non-convergent sequence. Non-convergent means as you go from x1 to x2 to x3 all the way up to infinity, it's not really coming to a single point. It's not getting closer and closer to a single point. It's all over the place. So we need to make this notion, yeah. Sorry, I didn't get your question. So why does the length of the sequence need to be infinity? Uh, you mean why does k go from 1 to infinity? Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's how sequences are defined. That's the definition of sequence. Uh, but if I'm thinking of sequence like a video, and each of those x is a frame in the video, then it doesn't necessarily go to infinity. Right, uh, but that's, the, that's not the mathematical definition of a sequence. Oh. Yeah. So mathematical definition of a sequence is the one where k goes all the way from 1 to infinity. So you have infinite number of points scattered in the space. So can you think of it like a, like a pattern rather than like that? Some sequences might have patterns. Some sequences may not have patterns. OK? It's not a sequence. Yeah, it's just a subset of a sequence. But it's a finite subset, so you don't really talk about convergent properties of that sequence anymore. It's not a sequence. No, it's not a sequence. Any other question? Awesome. So we talked about two types of sequences. One is convergent sequence, where eventually the points tend to converge to a, a, a single point in the space. And then non-convergent sequence, which means that the sequence, like the points are everywhere, all over the place. We need to make it a bit more mathematical. So let's give it a, let's define what a convergent sequence is. So xk, which is a sequence, converges to x if and only if for every epsilon greater than 0, there exists an n epsilon. Such that norm of xk minus x is less than epsilon for all k greater than or equal to n epsilon. We'll unpack this definition in a bit. I have a sequence. I'm saying that this sequence converges to x, so x will be like the center of the spiral. It converges to x if and only if I pick an epsilon greater than 0, and I look at the tail of the sequence. So right, this is the tail of the sequence. So k is greater than or equal to n epsilon. So I look at the tail of the sequence, and the tail of the sequence minus x is always within epsilon distance. Uh, I mean, it's always less than epsilon. The distance is always less than epsilon, right? So that's the definition of a convergent sequence. So I look at this sequence, and I pick 
uh, an epsilon ball around x. Let me say this is the epsilon ball around x. So you can see that after x5, all the other points, x6, x7, x8, all the way up to x infinity, they all lie within that epsilon ball. And I can make epsilon very, very small. I can keep making epsilon smaller and smaller. But you will notice that you can always find a tail. And the entire tail lies within that epsilon ball around x. OK? So that's a convergent sequence. That's the definition of convergent sequence. Sequence converges if you plot an epsilon ball around x. And you look at the tail, and the tail contains. There is some tail. And the entire tail is contained within that epsilon ball. Why is this definition important? Why do we care about convergent sequence? I have an optimization problem. I'm solving that optimization problem. I wrote a MATLAB code. I wrote a Python code. I'm training a neural network. I've written a code about it. I now need to know whether I'm done with the optimization. I'm running the code. I'm seeing the output. Am I done with the optimization? Am I supposed to stop, or am I supposed to keep running? And the way to come up with that criteria of whether to stop or whether to continue running is to look at the tail of the sequence that is coming out of your optimization code. And as long as the tail doesn't have too much variation, right? so this tail doesn't have too much variation. It's all within epsilon distance from x. So as long as the tail doesn't have too much variation, you are like, I'm done. My code is finished. I'm able to converse to a solution. right? But there is one important problem that we still not talked about, and that be, we'll be talking about in the rest of the course. How do we know that whatever we have conversed to is an actual solution, or it's just some random point in the space? And that is going to eat up the most of the, the, entire, the entire course, because in optimization, it's very important to know whether you have conversed to the right solution, or you have just conversed to something which is may not be a solution. So we'll talk about a lot of those nitty gritties in the subsequent classes. But uh, we'll, we'll talk about sequences and subsequences in the next class. Uh, we'll take uh, and then we'll talk about Cauchy sequence. And we'll talk about Leminf and Lim soup in the next class. So I think there is quite a bit of sequences stuff that we'll be talking about. After which, we'll talk about matrices. After which, we'll talk about convex sets and convex functions. So that's all I have for you guys today. Uh, questions? Yeah. I want to know what that symbol means. Uh, I think they converted E. Kind of the mirror E. This one? No. No, no. after zero. Yeah. Oh. Uh, right. So this is for all. I'm so sorry. I should have mentioned it. This is there exists. This is the symbol for for all, and this is the symbol for there exists. So how do you find the x and epsilon? Since epsilon, if you make epsilon large enough. So this is for all epsilon. So you, you pick epsilon. I'm supposed to give you an n epsilon, mm -hmm. such that for the entire tail is within that epsilon ball of x. So how do you find the value of you only need to find the value of n epsilon. So we'll see some examples in the next class. We don't have time today to cover those examples. Yes? You talk about tail. I don't know if I heard you correctly. Like a tail, T-A-I-L. Tail, yeah, tail. This is xk, k greater than or equal to n epsilon. That's the tail of the sequence. So sequence has a tail, and this is the tail. This is how we define the tail. So it's a uh, sort of math uh, concepts, or a? Uh, this is, yeah, tail is something we use in math as well. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much, and I'll see you guys on Friday.
as a turn off the video.